Everywhere you turn in Jacqueline Lewis's home, you'll spot pictures of her son, Sean. He loved taking care of his family. Sean also loved art, the outdoors. But more than anything, he adored his daughter, Ava. I think he got that one special because it has your name on it. He did. On top of being a dad, Sean also had a soft spot for those suffering. And he had a heart for people that were broken because he felt broken. Broken because for 20 years, Sean battled substance abuse. What effect does it have on a family? What kind of ripple effect does it have? I think as a parent, there's a lot of anguish. It's, it's a 24 seven, it doesn't go away. I just watched him every day get up and fight to live. He was fighting just to live. For two decades, Sean battled addiction, but that ended in October 2022, when he died of an overdose. At the time, his daughter, Ava, just seven years old. I see her, I have to watch her on days where she's curled up in a fetal position crying, wailing, because she wants her daddy and he's not here. After losing her son, Jacqueline is now raising her granddaughter. An overdose also took Ava's mother's life. Two parents' deaths impacting the life of this little girl. And I know it's going to progress as she gets older. She's going to have a lot more questions. There's going to be a lot more to explain to her when she's better able to understand it. Sean's substance abuse centered around opioids, the class of powerful pain-reducing drugs responsible for the majority of overdoses, sometimes prescribed by doctors, but often bought and sold illegally on the streets or online. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, more than half a million people have died of drug overdoses involving opioids since 2010. Sean was originally prescribed an opioid for scoliosis pain. In middle school, the doctors uh, started prescribing him pain medications. We didn't know they were addictive at that time. Stories like his have fueled thousands of lawsuits against opioid manufacturers, distributors, and retailers. Families of those who died and the communities devastated by the overdose epidemic are demanding accountability from the industry for allegedly downplaying the risk associated with the drugs. So far, those lawsuits have resulted in industry changes and more than $50 billion in settlement dollars that will go to state and local governments across the country. But after that, exactly where that money is going can be difficult to pin down. The settlement set out general guidelines for spending, requiring most of the funds go towards certain types of efforts to reduce overdoses. Things like prevention education programs, overdose reversal kits, or addiction treatment facilities. But state and local governments only have to publicly report for money spent outside those categories. Investigate TV found, so far, only a small number have, and it's the companies that settled that are tasked with enforcing the rules. Governments can offer greater transparency, but our partners at KFF Health News and an attorney at OpioidSettlementTracker.com found few efforts to do so. According to their analysis, only around one-third of states have promised the public detailed reporting of where millions of dollars are going. From a, a public health standpoint, community members should be educated about what's being done with the settlement monies before they roll out. Diana Fishbein is a professor and researcher at the University of North Carolina, one of a handful of states committed to sharing spending details with the public. Her primary focus is prevention. Historically, it's been dramatically underfunded and underappreciated. And that contrasts with the data that's been amassed in prevention showing how potent it can be. Fishbein and other experts say one of the most impactful ways communities can better invest in prevention is by starting early and addressing the root causes of addiction, such as trauma, food insecurity, or lack of access to health care. But we don't focus so much on uh, providing the services that are needed for children to grow up healthfully and have the supports in their social environment that will avert their pathways away from substance use altogether. But what researchers suggest isn't necessarily playing out in reality. 
When Investigate TV and KFF Health News look for examples of how local governments are approaching youth prevention, we found multiple examples of settlement money going to a program that's been criticized in the past. Now we're saying no to drugs. The Drug Abuse Resistance Education Program, or DARE, emerged in the 1980s with law enforcement educating kids on resisting drugs. But studies in the 1990s cast doubt on whether D.A.R.E. actually worked. And now some critics question whether that money should be going to the program. We have a brand new D.A.R.E. D.A.R.E. reworked its curriculum in the early 2000s to address the concerns. It's more student-based uh, than, it, uh, than instructor-based uh, is, is one difference. We traveled to Los Angeles, the birthplace of the D.A.R.E. program, to ask how they revamped and improved the program and why it should be part of settlement dollars when its outcomes have been questioned. The old curriculum was, um, it was 17 lessons and it was a didactic download from the officer. The new curriculum is 10 lessons long. The officer only talks seven or eight minutes. Instead of framing drugs as a scary thing for teens, Francisco Pagueros, CEO of Dare America, says the new program includes the students in the conversation, like role playing, and talks about how their decisions will affect their health and families. Do you think this is a good use for the money? Yes, it can be if it's approached correctly. It's, it, it's if you're looking to just spend money, it's not it's not going to be productive. DARE isn't alone in getting money for drug education. Opioid settlement money allowed this program, called Project Success, to expand to nearly all public school districts in Rhode Island. The program, which, like DARE, also started in the 80s, trains professional counselors in addiction prevention education using sessions like this and places them in public schools. But Project Success goes beyond the classroom and simply teaching. Counselors also work one-on-one -on -one with students, including those who are at high risk or currently battling substance issues. By placing a student assistance counselor in the school, for many kids, that is the caring adult in their life who's consistent throughout their high school and middle school career. That was her favorite shirt he wore, so she wanted to keep that. Back in Ohio, supporting children at higher risk of addiction is something Jacqueline Lewis wants her state leaders to use settlement money for, especially for kids like her granddaughter. But Ohio is one of the states that has been criticized for not including the public in the conversation. My concern is um, that none of this money is going to go help impacted families. For now, she takes things one day at a time. The days are tough. The tears still come, but she keeps going, fighting for prevention and transparency when it comes to funding for herself, for Ava, and to honor Sean.